Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Ayal from the Virtual Enterprise AI user group. And uh, this is a, a joint presentation of uh, this virtual user group with the Jacksonville uh, AI user group, which is uh, currently also virtual due to the COVID situation. So um, Vivian is uh, the common uh, thread between the two uh, user groups, but uh, she is uh, not well today but she's the one who uh, worked to organize this uh, meetup. And uh, we have uh, AJ Alexander to uh, deliver today's presentation. So I'm going to let uh, AJ um, introduce himself and uh, move to his presentation. Thank you very much for uh, showing up. Uh, and uh, we will have this uh, recording stay here on the, on the channel when we're done. So uh, you have the stage, AJ. Hey, y'all, appreciate, appreciate uh, thank you for having me, uh, Vivian, thank you for having me to the, to the audience and, and uh, members of the group. Uh, looking forward uh, to uh, sharing uh, and, and being able to educate you guys on, on what, uh, where we see the industry heading from an enterprise AI perspective, but applied to um, more so in operational and, and manufacturing uh, applications and elements. So let me know, y'all, if you guys can, uh, you guys can see my screen. Um, yeah, I think we. Sorry, sorry about that. There's a train in my office. In my office, there's a train actually going by behind me. So uh, another second's pretty loud. Uh, my office actually is currently in uh, Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, North Georgia area. Um, but we're, we do have headquarters based out of Jacksonville. So, like you all said, my name is AJ Alexander, co-founder and CRO for uh, for the Sorbotics. A Sorbonics group, our platform and technology is called uh, Sorbo. And everybody, can you still hear me okay, EL? Your audio wasn't okay. uh, great, but I think it just got better. It just got better? Okay, yeah, I think it would, would deadpan. So part of our, uh, so what we do at Sorbo is we make smart simple. And how do we do that? We enter, we essentially automate the entire life cycle uh, of, of deploying machine learning algorithms uh, from the cloud to the edge. So that whole process of the data collection, uh, ETL of that data, to visualizing that data, to training the models, to validating the models, to deploying that model, and then to retraining that model, um, and then having that iterative uh, cycle and feedback, that is what we do with our software. And our software essentially, um, like I said, it is an enterprise AI platform uh, really tailored towards both data scientists and folks that don't necessarily have the academia background to, to build a model. Um, so we try to we try to bridge that gap and we provide that mechanism for uh, a lot of these customers that uh, want to just solve high value problems with, with artificial intelligence. So I'll just give you guys some context. We have a global footprint uh, all over the world. Uh, some of our use cases spanning from predicting paper machines from failing to monitoring hundreds of locomotives to helping food and beverage companies reduce their you know, total electrical or uh, fuel consumption spends. So a wide variety of use cases, uh, you know, horizontally across all the industries, manufacturing, utilities, or transportation. And uh, that is, you know, we do have a broad, uh, a broad portfolio. So what I kind of, what I want to share with you guys today is, is to really talk about this theme that, with digital transformation, how we define that, uh, obviously being IoT data collection, all the IoT protocols, all the models available, you know, and really where do we see the industry heading um, to define what, what digital transformation is. And, and then also obviously talking about some of the auto um, auto machine learning, auto uh, automation aspects of, of where we also see AI heading. And just to keep in mind that digital transformation uh, is a journey and not a destination. So what, what we usually have identified and uh, really see the industry, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of this to you guys is, uh, could be somewhat repetitive. You know, everyone knows the buzzwords uh, when we talk about Industry 4.0, when we talk about um, you know, uh, uh, big data, artificial intelligence. So if we had to really, uh, really sum that up, uh, our in, in manufacturing and, and some of these you know, very industrial and asset intensive industries, is you know they've traditionally gone through four uh, you know four four uh, steps or 
or, or evolutions uh, in their uh, how they essentially make product and uh, are worried about you know, uh, customer satisfaction. So what we call Industry 4.0 is really the evolution of the connectivity of things. And you know, uh, you guys all heard of IoT, but in this industry we call industrial IoT. And what really industrial IoT is is a, is, is, is a is a type of source that with the connectivity of things and with all this data coming online to essentially make decisions with AI and then deploying that uh, back down to the plant level to ultimately improve efficiency, you know, increase some of these bottom lines, you know, reduce quality, improve safety. And that's really the goal um, of, 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 of industry 4.0. So as to, to do more with less and to also, you know, be cognizant that, you know, for, especially for a lot of our North American manufacturers, uh, you know, for them to be competitive with the global market and landscape, that is to innovate, and that is to adopt, uh, you know, new emerging technologies that can allow them to, you know, make their overall team much more efficient and, and to focus on some of their higher value uh, problems and assets. But when you look at this particular step in anyone's journey, you know, it's usually most of the time is spent on, you know, how are we converting some of our physical systems into 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 cyber systems? Uh, and then how we define that in our line of work is really, you know, they're gonna need sensors, they're gonna need to, uh, you know, probably, you know, instead of dealing with relational databases, they should explore some of these open source, uh, non-relational databases, from a, more so from a time series, uh, time series historian perspective. Uh, persistence, persistence layers. But once they've identified, you know, where do they really struggle? The next is, you know, we'll talk about how do you integrate all those data sources, um, the vis and then once those data sources are integrated, do you have the ability to really understand um, what what's going on with with the data? And and and, and it's essentially just understanding your first principles and how can you apply, you know, those rules based uh, first principles to kind of build a baseline to say this is where we were at yesterday, this is where we're at today, and this is where we'd like to be tomorrow, just based on the current data that's available at your hands. Most of the folks you know, on this call uh, could probably attest to that the, the hardest part of any data scientist or any uh, artificial intelligence application is really getting your hands um, on, on that data. If it's you know, of enough volume, enough variety, uh, you know, of enough velocity, and I think I'm missing another V, but these are super important uh, steps that you know, uh, uh, the people that are in, going down this path will need to hit. <laughs> so what I put here, um, and, and so there's gonna be, I guess, two groups that I'm gonna be speaking to, what we call the IT side of the world and then the OT side of the world. And every environment um, in, in the industry uh, from a technology stack perspective, they all adhere to what we call uh, the ISA 95 uh, Purdue model. And it's a hierarchy that really shows you, you know, all the different uh, software uh, software uh, packages or software systems that are uh, really critical and functional to these manufacturers making product, um, you know, and, and then making sure that their supply chain is performing based on demand and customer order, places in order, and it all starts with what we call that uh, production and planning uh, scheduling. So. Think of um, if we had to think about this from a data perspective. You know, we're we're talking, you know, billions and and, and trillions of rows of, of information, and some of these inputs and some of these attributes, you know, kind of we see here are uh, really things on uh, like temperature, uh, vibration. Uh, you know, we talked about uh, type of order, skews. There's just so much information in these manufacturing environments based on all these systems that you see in a technology stack. The, the real key is how do you make sense of all of that? Um, so what I will touch on later is uh, what we call having this unified namespace and having all of these systems talking to one to one decentralized, uh, what we'll call an MQTT broker that, uh, and then we're gonna talk about some of those, uh, some of those directional paths where uh, from data being collected to the storage of that data, to how data gets transferred how it gets massaged and manipulated, and ultimately, how do you make sense? Uh, how do you make sense of that data? So when when organizations can understand this stack and and, and take inventory and, and, and really determine how legacy are they and where do they need to be in terms of future state, uh, how we define some of those future state architectures is, is really like, like we talked about, having a centralized data platform that can power 
all of your existing applications and essentially make them smarter. And the result of that is kind of what you see here on the right, uh, anything from being able to generate new revenue models, um, having a, a, a predictive or an optimization capability of some a process, whether like we talked about, if it's gas or, or, or electricity, or if it's I'm trying to increase my overall effectiveness of this particular line, uh, and that's measured, uh, you know, by availability, uh, by performance, uh, and then by 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 uh, by quality. Uh, so some standard, very some standard KPIs that you know these guys, uh, guys and gals, really live and die uh, die by every single day. And then at the end of the day, they want to make as much product, make as much quality product, but also, you know, be safe and then try to do it uh, with, you know, as lean, as lean as possible. Um, some, some of those use cases, kind of like what you see here, everything can really start from predicting some sort of event, um, describing or being able to label that event, and then ultimately applying some of those, uh, some of those root cause or some of those known labeled parameters on these failure signatures. So these three buckets uh, can also be applied uh, with your three main groups in every uh, every manufacturing or utility or transportation uh, industry, what we call maintenance, operations, personnel, uh, probably working really close together and ultimately quality. Um, so I have a question for the group and I think it's a, a rhetorical question, but before anyone, before any artificial intelligence or uh, machine learning application that's built, you really have to, like I mentioned here, build that house. And I kind of touched on it earlier. Well, how do we, how do we do that? So what you see here is, uh, an example, a topology, a network topology of some, some of these systems and some of these environments today. Um, every single one of these uh, assets in a manufacturing environment are control, uh, 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 controlled by what we call PLC, a programmable logic controller that is, uh, you know, a mixture of you know, ladder base, uh, ladder logic, uh, you know, C++. So it's a very uh, what they call control, uh, control type of coding uh, to have uh, to have these systems, you know, moving on a rotational or on a time, some sort of time event basis. Uh, so a lot of a lot of our world, what we call these PLCs, uh, for many years from industry one, for industry one to industry three, you know, you know being being programmed, uh, you know, configuring sensors into those PLCs to give you some sort of parameter uh, to help you uh, be uh, to help these manufacturers uh, be much more efficient, right? So what you see here at a, at a fundamental level is what we see are your standard, oops, so what your what we call your PLCs. Uh, the next, and, and, and if you have to think about like the 70s, 80s, you know, a lot of these inputs were very analog. Uh, you know, uh, we're talking Boolean values, you know, uh, on off. And now the, the, the key is now how do you digitize some of these values? And, and, and some, of those, some of those digital values, like I talked about, could be process, uh, temperature, vibration, uh, you know, RPMs, uh, uh, voltage, uh, you know, amperage. Uh, current, you know, there's just a lot of information just that comes from some of these systems because beneath these systems, like I mentioned, could be a bottling line, could be a cogen turbine engine, all have their own kind of smarts um, already ready built in. But the key, the key to, so what you see here from the very device level all the way to the cloud is you want to really have all of these uh, uh, systems, all these different uh, I.O. modules, you want them all to be speaking the same language. And that real language adheres to what we call, uh, you know, uh, some of these drivers we call Ethernet IP, where there, uh, and then some are like Profinet, uh, some of them could be Modbus TCP, um, some of them BACnet for, uh, as a protocol, if you want to talk to certain systems from the building facility side of, of, of a plant, um, there's things where, we, you know, we talk about like very legacy, uh, protocols like serial. So think, you know, protocols and communication drivers and data data drivers that have been around for many, many years, that is sometimes hard to support. And with those old data drivers, uh, what comes with that is a lot of vulnerability, uh, maybe uh, not, not the latency that you're expecting with some of the cloud compute that's available today. And so there is obviously, you know, with, we talk about COBOL, I joke a lot of, a lot with people, and that's how I try to make the comparison. Some of these legacy protocols could be compared to like coding in a, in a COBOL environment. Uh, what you see here, we call a, an SDE. So an SDE is really uh, the, what we, uh, just in general, what we call a smart data engine. 
So the industry, um, traditionally, there was a big wave of pushing all this data uh, to the cloud. And what we're seeing the industry heading, uh, most of the big companies in the world, they're trying to make sure that the processing and that collection engine really needs to be taking place as close to the device level as possible, uh, especially with IoT. And why that's important is be, number one, from a latency perspective. And then number two, uh, from just a pure telemetry aspect. So as you can imagine, sending all that data to the cloud, that'd be a pretty expensive bill to whoever's managing those servers. So as much of that processing, they could chop up those data, you know, only send things on like a report by error exception. The industry, there's a whole, there's a whole movement right now of what we call it this decentralized, decoupled um, uh, movement where it's very, you, have, you think about blockchain, um, when those applications, just from a decentralized decentralization aspect, that is the same concept that a lot of these customers um, are trying to apply. So the key with any edge platform uh, is to have what we call an agnostic capability to connect to any sensor, any PLC, um, any automation system. So to not only have the driver available to do that, to convert those values from analog to digital, but to also uh, be able to pre-process that data and then send that those data streams, you know, via a JSON, a JSON format. If you're wanting to send it in a parquet format for more for more compression, if you want to send it in a certain uh, data science parameter or, or 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 output or format like Panda, that could be done as well. So that's really what your smart data engine um, should be should be able to live locally at the machine level. And if I jump back, uh, you know. Part of this, what you see here, this is what we call our, our, our the process control network of every side. And what you see right here is what we call the DMZ. So a, de, a, a demilitarized zone where everything that lives in this physical layer, um, some of these level three, level four systems, they have a lot of you know, firewall. So firewall here, firewall here. And once you pass that firewall, you're in what we call you know, the enterprise network. So most of your ERP systems, uh, most of your business systems um, are going to be living and be hosted by one of the one of the three big boys. So this MQTT protocol, which I'm sure uh, the folks on this call uh, are are familiar with, MQTT is a way where uh, it's essentially a client server relationship for you to publish and subscribe data of uh, data uh, data inputs and and, and parameters or in our world we call tags. The ability to have that um, polling. Not, not necessarily always constantly pulling mechanism. That's what we call a legacy type of way of getting information or getting messages. MQTT is the, is the way of the future and it was developed uh, in, in the late 70s or early, uh, the, at least the, the, the protocol or, or the code was uh, by, by a company called SiriusLink. So this is a MQTT broker. Like I said, you guys are all probably really familiar with. Um, you know, the Facebooks of the world, they all leverage this with just sending messages and being able to standardize on uh, if I want to access any kind of KPI across an organization, it would be in this same format. And, it, and with that format, it gives you all these different, um, you know, attributes associated with uh, with uh, with that JSON with that JSON file. So just a lot of a lot of information that's getting compressed very efficiently. Uh, number one, number two, it, the way it's uh, uh, not only uh, tra collecting, transferring that information, but the way that information is also parsed out. So MQTT uh, should, you know, uh, lighten the load on a lot of these networks. It's also a very secure way. Uh, it's also very a secure way of 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 collecting data. That so this whole these whole processes. I'm kind of just I can sum it up as what we call an ETL. So the ETL process and then transferring, just being able to move data all across the organization really should be adhered to these MQTT protocols. Uh, something similar to that is like a AMQP, you know, HTTPS. So a lot of these, you know, high performing, you know, web-based, um, you know, applications that we use on a daily basis, you know, adhere to, to MQTT. So having all of this being said, um, we call this your unified namespace. And having your unified namespace um, is really how how you build um, how you build the foundation for digital transformation. And unified namespace, believe it or not, could be applied to any to any application. So once you've built, whether you're in manufacturing or if you're in e-commerce or if you're uh, you know in the banking financial industry, uh, having this level of data flow and data transparency is going to allow data scientists to be much more successful because they know that they're going to get data consistently all the time, that it will be in the format that they need 
uh, you know, archived and historized over a period of X amount of time. So it's going to allow these applications to actually be sped up and actually be converted into business value and business success a lot quicker. So what is a, what? So now that we built the house and the foundation of our, excuse me, foundation of our house, and now we're ready to start putting up, you know, some of the uh, some of the support beams, some of the drywall. Let's just call this process building the remaining of our house an actually deploying a model. So you know, any typical data scientist, you know, is going to go through this journey from finding the the input and uh, the data they they need. And uh, understanding that there's a lot of uh, like auto ML pipelines in the marketplace. So we talk about you know Azure Studio, you know AWS. Um, their uh, their pipeline for whatever reason it's, it's not coming to mind. So there's a what you see right now is that the industry uh, from the IBMs to the world they're giving they're giving their community and they're giving their users a way to rapidly build models and to contextualize those models. Uh, essentially, being able to say this model based on these scores is going to do its job. Now it's time to validate and deploy it into, into production. Uh, so once, you know, once that has been, uh, once that what we call, and we like to call these algorithms, um, uh, almost like we call them, we call them like a virtual operator or your co-pilot to help you achieve uh, whatever level of automation or task that is you're trying to, uh, that you're trying to achieve with AI machine learning. Taking that model and deploying it uh, back down to the edge. So the edge, like we talked about, it's a runtime that's usually built, uh, it's usually most of these runtimes are like Linux based or uh, you know, Ubuntu. So just this whole uh, you know, concept of, uh, of that decentralized you know, open source movement where a lot, of syst a lot of applications, not knocking on Microsoft here, but most of the systems that we are exposed to today are Windows based. And you know, with Windows based, obviously we don't have to go into much detail, but you really wanna be able to deal with those, um, th uh, those those mechanisms in IoT like like open source, like Linux, uh, and those distros, and then also understanding you want to be dealing with you know uh, non-relational databases. So once you've mapped that model back to your edge runtime, and that runtime, like I said, it could be living in a Raspberry Pi, it could be uh, you know running on a Docker, on a Kubernetes Docker, it could be running on a you know a traditional you know, you know VM. Uh, so it's it's pretty unique on where you want to have uh, actually have that runtime and that processing power. Um, and like I said, you, there's runtimes available in the cloud, but depending on the need or depending on you know what it is you're trying to accomplish, having that information processing and that compute as close to the pain or as close to the application that you need is really is really the key. And then how you interpret and, and take that output, machine learning output, and make actual sense of it from an application business perspective. And then understanding that really work with machine learning, if you build a really good template and you build a really good hier uh, uh, hierarchy and you understand that the problem that you're trying to solve with AI could also be applied to 10 of the same problems uh, and you and, and at scale, you want to you really want to think about how can I uh, implement or automate that transfer learning process. So to propagate that that file across the same uh, across the same problem with the same kind of inputs and outputs and, and uh, with the same kind of business objective, we would call that process transfer learning. And an example, we'll give like a steel customer. Let's say a steel customer has developed a sorbot or any kind of other machine learning model, and that sorbot is going to you know, control the steam flow of a of their boiler in addition to uh, being able to uh, control or optimize the output steam pre uh, output steam pressure oh, excuse me no control the steam control the steam pressure valve and then optimize uh, some sort of parameter output but the goal of controlling that uh, that steam pressure is to maybe say reduce electricity or reduce gas. And then lastly, the whole, uh, what's really cool about where we see, you know, Google, you know, even heading is what we call auto ML. So the whole retraining aspect, having these models, learning online, real time, uh, being able to, you know, we have to curate them, but it, it, the sooner you can get them in production, I think it's going to be better, uh, better for anyone's app application. Uh, so I kind of skipped ahead. These are some of the data sources that are available in our industry. So we talk about you know, vibration, pressure sensors, uh, you know, thermography. You have your all your PLCs, your leg legacy-based stuff. You have your what we call your distributed control systems. Uh, SCADA stands for Supervisor Control and Data Acquisition. So it's a front end that is showing you the overall operational 
health of your system, of your plant. You know, historian, uh, you guys can all relate like a data lake, MES, which stands for Manufacturing Execution System, uh, CMMS, your maintenance management system, more your business systems, and this whole tr journey right here, the data balancing, the dimensionality, and we're going to get into that a little later. So kind of showing you the steps that are, are, are starting to be more automated uh, uh, throughout the industry. Um, and then at the output for us, some of these use cases, and it's really some of the out applications where we call smart process optimization control, the ability to create a digital twin forecaster to uh, essentially simulate what if conditions or predict different production scheduling uh, events and demands, and lastly, asset health monitoring which is really understanding the component health of, of that asset and how can we uh, reduce maintenance costs and help, um, help, help these operators become more efficient. So I, as I posed the question, why, why automate your ETL data pipelines? And why is it important that you guys have these, have these mechanisms in place? Um, so what will, you know, traditionally, you know, working, working in Excel, you know, most of this data is, you know, uh, we talk about data in motion, you know, having this cold data source. So traditionally, you know, you'll take a CSV file, you know, it having to, for us, we are dealing with time series data, uh, uh, numerical data, and then also being able to have the ability to, you know, handle, um, you know, uh, uh, text text files or, or, or images. So to do natural language processing or to do, some sort of classification with images. That is that is something that um, is also uh, with, with an application in the industry. But if we just had a focus on, uh, you know, basically time series data, time series data that is uh, really important, especially when wanting to make predictions and then wanting to understand behavior and where patterns are, are, are trending. And for us, just having, you know, making sure that, you know, that timestamp, um, and, you know, is it within that correct format? As you can see here, you know, the headers of these columns are all very important inputs um, and, 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 and features that are going to be important to how we model and how we make sense of, of, of the training output. Um, and then another, another function is once you have had that uh, data imported into whatever ML environment you're using, and when that that data is training against the model, and that model is an actual in a runtime environment. We would call, we would consider that that data now data in motion or hot data. What you wanna what you also wanna understand is with the ETL uh, tools available in the market, uh, automating your data pipelines is really important. And what I mean by that is you want to be able to uh, have some sort of mechanism or tool at your at your disposal that will allow you to basically point your client. Uh, to our particular driver, or we'll call a, a server, a server application, and request information on some sort of uh, uh, interval or uh, frequency that you deem, like on a rising edge, cyclical edge, once a second, every thirty seconds, especially for these parameters. So when I show this screen here, guys, these are just some some commonly known drivers in the industry, uh, from drivers for you know uh, locomotives to uh, public transit. Where or you got things where we got CAN bus, which is a typical data driver uh, for Arduino. Um, we talked about you know these are some these are some sensor vib specific vibration sensors where once you request you don't have to write any code. You really shouldn't be spending your time, especially as a data scientist, on having to write code to collect the data to make sure that data is in the right format and then to, to be trained against uh, the models. The whole purpose of automating your data pipelines is to allow you to speed up. What you do best, and that is building models and making these models make sense uh, per your per your application. Um, we talked about some of the some of the previously some of the legacy based stuff, and then you know everyone is uh, pretty familiar with with OPC. It's a, it's a standard. It's an abstraction layer that essentially protect, protects all the control systems, so you can uh, let by legacy pull pull information that you need. Um, and then I put some examples here. We also you know it's a, you know maybe per your application you might need weather data, or you might need you might need to uh, you know tap into a you know SQL Server database. So being able to do that on demand um, for your application is, is really important. And there's a lot there's a lot of sources out there that that allows you to do that. Uh, another another component is if for you guys to also be successful in building a model is uh, you know maybe the driver uh, that you're looking for isn't available so you may you may need to write your own code and you may need to develop 
uh, very quickly. And what you see here is actually, uh, I, you know, Node Red. So you could use a tool like Node Red and and do things on a very, you know, object oriented basis, uh, you know, very very uh, easily. And you'd be surprised, you know, what kind of nodes are available. They got a node for everything, and everything you want to do from orchestration layer uh, prior to building a model and getting getting the data and the features that you need uh, could be done in an environment like Node Red. So a lot of a lot of stuff you could do here. Um, I don't have to spend too much time on it because Node-RED is such a common uh, common open source tool. Um, and then once once you have once you're consistent and once you're comfortable with your data pipeline that you've configured, now is time where you want to start at least validating um, at least validating that pipeline. So you know how consistently am I getting that data? Is uh, you know do these values make sense? Is the scaling correct? You know you really want to be able to confirm what you know what these pipelines are looking only when you're dealing with with some of these time series applications. So I have data, great, now what? So once you have your data, now it's time to you know, import that data into any environment and, and, and really start calculating and automating uh, you know, some, of these, uh, some of these data scientist uh, analyses tools that you guys use um, every single day uh, to make better decisions. So whether that's a summary, you know, a histogram, you know, correlation is great for seeing you know, what data points are you know highly correlated uh, versus negatively correlated, you know, uh, negative or positive, and if they are uh, ne uh, highly uh, negatively correlated, you know we can eliminate that uh, from our modeling. Why? Because you know it's going to take more time, and dirty data in will mean dirty uh, dirty results uh, out. So we always want to make sure you guys are uh, you know, understanding uh, of the data prior to uh, prior to being trained by a model. And then what's also, you know, what's also unique um, and, and that you guys should be looking for as you're training your data is, is understanding the contribution. You know, what is this data point just based on the data? How highly contributed is it to uh, you know, a particular data point? And then in our world, you know, we talk about power, you know, ambient outdoor temperature, the compressor speed. So what's the relationship between the speed? Um, if I adjust the speed of this compressor, you know, what does the power output look like? Is, so those are some things that you could be kind of looking at prior to training a model. And then you also want to ask the question, you know, do I need to even apply analytics or some sort of rule on top of that data point? Uh, so per your application, let's say you determine that, yes, I want to monitor this particular parameter. I want to model some sort of parameter, but I only want to monitor it at, um, based on this kind of condition. So you should be thinking in that realm where, you know, every data point, and what its function is in the real world, you know, it has certain conditions. You really want to, you really want to be clear um, that if you have those extra rules uh, configured for that data point, that is going to increase your confidence and increase your ability, um, in, in, in making sure that the results are actually, you know, uh, you know, uh, 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 validated or make sure that the results are uh, results that. Uh, you know, there's no bias, right? So you're trying to eliminate as much bias to your training as possible. How do you determine? How do you determine the most efficient uh, auto ML techniques? So this, <clears throat> this is uh, like, like like we talked about. There's a lot of automation occurring in the industry, um, and we can I think break this down or into a four or five subsets. So when we talk about machine learning, um, we're talking about unsupervised learning, uh, supervised learning, running regressions. Uh, being able to run different flavors of aggression to create what we call digital twin and then running different flavors of that digital twin to create what we call optimization for for in our world that those are some of the buckets that we describe machine learning in uh, what you see here is uh, you know some common uh, some common stuff that you know is available at tensorflow uh, scikit uh, you know cares a lot of the most most of these libraries um, you know most of these models are in the libraries that you guys are familiar with but the key is uh, into what we're, we're going to talk about uh, what what the applications are for for, for clustering or understanding you know this is really bad data uh, you know anomaly detection at, at, at the very core and then you know you see here things like Gaussian mixed mode you know, k mean so you're basically having uh, having this understanding you're being able to quickly group you know what is the best model per my application or if I should have some sort of uh, workflow in place that maybe could iterate through all those models uh, really quickly to see who's the best fit. 
uh, we talked about supervised learning where uh, you, know, you are going to, uh, somebody has to label bad data. Uh, that's great, you can determine anomalies, but you really need to be able to say, uh, you guys having that understanding of the process as a domain expert, uh, you would uh, should be able to retrain that data now that you have a known window of time uh, and understanding the behavior of that data and the patterns of that data, you would now uh, train it through a supervised learning model. So these are some examples that, that we see in the industry from a library perspective that should be packaged and ready to go for you to train against. Talked about regression, and then we talked about like digital twins. So an application with with uh, with uh, data in the data science community for people creating digital twins are you know hey this is our, our current real time value uh, representation of let's say speed, but based on how this motor always run always runs at this time of day for this kind of demand um, you know on this kind of weather condition blah 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 that you, know, you should be able to be able to predict what the speed should be at. So if the speed is the current speed of that system is not matching up, that value is not matching with the predicted value of, that, uh, uh, of what the regression algorithm is saying, there's an error between the two. So to be able to identify the error quickly and then and understand what is happening either upstream or downstream of my process, that's not allowing me to hit that predicted value consistently in real time you know, over and over again. So it's a way to model your process with data to make decisions or to do what if scenarios or to forecast certain events in the future, uh, you know, very similar with what NOAA does with how they predict the weather, but in this application, uh, just for, for certain kind of events. So it's really cool to see that even on the supply chain, supply chain world where if you, if you deploy that model, you should learn and it should be able to tell you where it, it needs to be at in the future. So if it could identify the error quickly and it correct itself, in theory, it should learn and be able to hit hit that every single time. Uh, the world of process optimization and control is also using a different a combination of different techniques and machine learning techniques. But the goal here from a data, data science perspective is to uh, reduce X to op and to maximize Y and the inverse is true. Uh, so there are certain parameters that you know maybe should not be controlled, uh, and what we'll do is let me let me jump real quick um, and explain what what this means in our world and, and from a manufacturing AI perspective. So what I'll do is let me share my screen um, and kind of explain uh, some of the relationships between these between these variables. Okay, so I'm gonna pull up. my whiteboard it'll let me okay so so what i mean by optimization and control is that we will use a boiler for example and the goal of deploying an optimization model on this boiler is to reduce our what we call our gas flow our gas flow by say let's say just some sort of x percentage traditionally um in 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 this industry Angel, I'm yep. sorry to interrupt you. I'm not sure what to show on the screen. You wanted to, me to show yep. the whiteboard? Yes, I have my whiteboard pulled up. Oh, it disappeared now. Okay. It was there can, you, can you see my whiteboard, EL? Not yet. Give me a second. Let me I, I saw it before. Just a slight hiccup. Technology isn't perfect. Figure it out. Okay. Let me try this again. Okay, my computer is freezing. Okay. Well. All right. Well. What I'll do is here, let me go back to my presentation. Uh, I, I know what I did wrong. I didn't stop sharing my other, my other computer. Let me jump back. Okay. <clears throat> can you see my screen now, y'all? I can see the same screen as uh, we saw before, yes. And okay. I can going through it. Cool. 
so what I was going to just show on a whiteboard, and it's not a big deal, was really the relationship. Um, when you understand some of these variables, you really want to know uh, what, what can be controlled and what not can be controlled. So in the world of optimization and even in data scientists, they use what some terms called advanced process control or, or model process control. And that's ultimately to achieve some sort of minimization or maximization in that in that process. So that data, uh, what you see here on the screen is representative of some sort of a very highly complex, highly controlled process. There's a lot of mechanisms and instrumentations in place. And there's math that is called a PID loop. So these uh, uh, proportional, integral, and derivative uh, formulas and algebraic, uh, no, no, basically essentially algebraic rules that have been coded into these systems is essentially trying to control the system so it doesn't exceed certain bounds in order to hit and meet an objective. But with those, with those PIDs that have been controlled and their whole objective is to tune and to optimize the process, but they're developed by humans and is also developed by you know, so certain events that maybe are static or there's some sort of aspect of that code or of, of that logic that is really doesn't apply. And it's kind of a very repetitive, a repetitive process. The whole goal of any control model, uh, any optimization model is to really reduce the error between what is expected versus how it's actually performing uh, in real time. So the independent variable, um, what to have a very successful AI model is you want to essentially pick the one or subset of data points that if you control this data point uh, and if you manipulate this data point, it's going to negatively impact um, whatever, whatever that process, whatever that objective is. So if we use a boiler, for example, you know, if I controlled my steam flow, my steam flow valve in order to reduce, in order to reduce, um, my my gas consumption uh, that uh, that would uh, maybe not be the best be best valve to close close to reduce steam flow so let's let the steam flow valve uh, actually no we're going to control the steam flow valve but what we don't want to do is maybe control another kind of instrumentation that is associated with uh, pressure uh, uh, or excuse me uh, some sort of yeah some sort of pressure valve or 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 some sort of like ammonia ammonia valve which is just kind of use what's what's available here you really, if you choose to optimize that valve, you're going to actually cause your system to consume more gas. So maybe you should focus on a speed element of, of that data, or maybe you really should focus on the steam pressure, a steam pressure valve. So if you control your steam pressure, not only are you seeing your gas go down, but you're also seeing your system behave uh, the way it should be behaving within those optimal bounds, and it's actually not causing you know, any kind of mechanical wear and tear. So that's really important. It can kind of, kind of sometimes get tricky. And then the last, what I mentioned is model process control. So now that you have this optimization model created, now you really need to maybe add some constraints to that model, some human constraints. So as the model identifies that event or that kind of behavior, it'll listen to the constraint, make the adjustment and proceed or retrain itself based on the constraints that were added to, uh, to the model. With, uh, with any machine learning project, you know you guys all understand some of the some of the nuances with optimizing, you know your hyperparameter. So kind of what you see here uh, is the ability to you know handle all the dance down sampling. You want to be able to make sure you address what is your pre-processing going to look like. You also wanted to you know kind of iterate through all the different dimensionality reductions that are our uh, algorithms that are available in the marketplace. So. And then, and then, lastly, that final goal of you know, post-processing and the whole online learning of scripting a model. You really, what you see here, guys, is you want to, you know, you want to be able to, you know, iterate through this as much as possible. So you're basically looking at, you know, four different pipelines, four to five different pipelines, and one pipeline. And within that one pipeline, you know, all these algorithms are working together to ultimately achieve what we call the best score. So now that you've had your data in the system and now you've actually got done training the model, you know, what does it look like to contextualize this and with some of the results? So part of uh, you guys training models and understanding your behavior of the data, no matter what industry you're in, is, is going to be you know, post-processed. How can you, you know, nicely and visually represent some of that data? So if you're looking at it from a time interval basis, as you can see here, um, in, in the world of machine learning, as you guys know, you're looking for something, uh, any kind of anomalous behavior that exceeds like an 80% uh, 
probabilistic threshold. And anything below that, and that could be defined as a sliding scale. It, you know, it doesn't have to be 80%, but usually scores that are greater than uh, 80% with unsupervised learning is uh, usually what you're shooting for uh, if you're dealing with like on a negative one to, uh, to one interval. Um, and then for classification, you're obviously wanting to look for things, you know, greater than 90, uh, greater than 95%. So for things that are unknown, I think a good score of greater than 80, and we'll touch on that, is good. So with that being said, as you can see here, uh, you know, we're seeing some variation in the data. Not good, not good. Oh my gosh, something happened within this time interval time event that would cause me to believe that this is bad data. Uh, so we talked about some of these scoring techniques and these metrics. Uh, so what I'm looking for here as a practitioner is saying, does is this anomaly score greater than 70%? It looks like uh, you know that scoring technique gives a silhouette score. Um, it gives you some of those pre-processing scoring metrics just to balance the data. It, it shows, you know, I, you know, in this case, I used a robust scaler uh, to pre-process the data you know, with some of these parameters. That's true. Uh, kind of shows you the dimensionality reduction side, and then some of these settings where, you know, again, there you could kind of get, you could either go the traditional way and working on all these scoring and and, uh, and outputs yourself, or you could uh, increase your time to value and then try to start working with systems and, and a lot of tools out there that'll automate automate this stuff for you. And then we talked about, you know, you kind of have your, some of your, your limits with your acceptance rate and then uh, and then the online learning capability that will come in later later on down the road. Um, so once once I'm actually comfortable with this, what you know process that I'm going through is like an offline validation process. And now I want to look at the tag ranking. So now that I've actually, you know, seen bad behavior in my data, I now want to understand what is the relationship between some of these parameters, and maybe it could give me more root causal, uh, a root causal view, and and thinking of it as, you know, Sherlock Holmes, uh, a crime happens, you know, law enforcement comes on the scene, they really need to call the expert, and that expert would be Sherlock Holmes, and Sherlock Holmes would tell you based on this tag ranking, well, your ambient outdoor temperature is your data point that's causing the, this disturbance or this bad behavior. Now, what does that mean? If you just look at this from a data perspective, it can mean absolutely nothing. But if you are a, you know, an engineering technician and your whole job is to uh, focus on the health of that, that system, you would absolutely know that. Maybe that sensor needs to be calibrated or you know, based on this condition, we adjusted X and that's why you know, we're, we're seeing this. So you know, that th this is super important and allows you to kind of get uh, get to uh, get to the, uh, the meat of the problem a, a lot quicker. So having that tag tag ranking, you guys be able to rank. Now I understand not all my data points are going to make sense, but if I could group that logically, um, I'm going to have a much better understanding of, of what I'm trying to train this model against. So once you have uh, labeled bad behavior, you would essentially now want to train that model. Uh, once that's been validated, you want to retrain that model like we talked about earlier through a supervised learning. As some sort of classification so you, you know you could go through it iteratively one by one you can do an auto base it's really up to you to be comfortable with that score we're going to talk about that score and then for me in this case you know maybe i'm just looking for that 80 percent window so anything that exceeded exceeded that threshold you know i'm going to label as bad data or a bad event and i want that supervised model to look at uh, a certain window of time in the future and then, or in the past and then in the future to give me what kind of win window and lead time we're working with. As you guys are you know, labeling your data, you really want to be as prognostic and as descriptive as you can. You know, so what, uh, we'll just use, because I know, I don't know who, what everyone's background is, but in our world, you know, there's a, there's a certain time, uh, there's maybe certain causes that are known. You want to understand when did it happen? You know, who was the operator technician on the scene? You know, how many hours was it downtime for? You know, what would this cost? What's traditionally the action steps we take? Um, so there's a lot of these metadata features that can be applied to labeling that as bad data that gives you that more, uh, I would say, prognostic way of understanding your data. So once you retrain that label data, that supervised model in theory should give you, like we talked about, almost a lead time, a lead time to countdown warning or trigger. So when it detects that certain pattern or behavior in the future, it should automatically uh, enable uh, what we call, you know, maybe I'll say three days or four days, 
if this problem is not corrected, you will expect uh, the uh, you will expect this event to happen based on uh, you know based on that threshold or based on uh, that sliding scale you've determined. So you want to really determine what's normal. If that model determines something is leading up to the event of not normal, it should be able to trigger you and give you an alert uh, much much more ahead of time. And what you see here, that was a work order I created uh, within the data set. Or you could take data, or, uh, like I said, uh, out from other sources and then import it into your model. So however creative you want to be, the point is you want to make sure you are uh, really accurate how you're labeling the models. And what you see here, uh, if I were to see the score as data scientist, as a practitioner, you know, 95, 96% is pretty damn good. I um, feel confident in this algorithm's ability to look for this particular failure mode in the future. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to want to run with this. I'm going to want to deploy this. And as you can see here, uh, kind of going through, like I mentioned, what's available standard scalar for pre-processing. I see my dimensionality reduction and I'm comfortable with what I'm seeing here. And uh, let's 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 deploy this bad boy. Uh, another application like we talked about uh, is process optimization and control. So for for data for practitioners, you know, you're essentially looking for how much variability or how much oscillation was, is within our data. And based on, like we talked about, between what's expected versus what's currently happening versus what should be happening in the future, you're gonna try to essentially, not average, but you're gonna wanna get some sort of theoretical saying, look, this data is representative of like 10% bad behavior. What can we do to minimize, minimize um, or, or 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 reduce that that ten percent to zero. We don't want any kind of any kind of disturbances in our data. So that's a, usually what you see here are some of these parameters. Now we talked earlier about you know what data points associated with certain levels of uh, uh, certain mechanical systems that you really should control. Uh, so what you see here is uh, you know, machine learning should really optimize based on historical a baseline, time series baseline, it should tell you that this water temperature gauge or flow meter should stay within the bounds of 89, whatever engine, whatever engineering unit they're using. So 89, which is a cubic feet. Um, and then it should never exceed what you see here on the right. It should never exceed that 96%, you know, cubic feet of, you know, whatever water, or whatever, whatever engineering you want to use that. So what this algorithm is really telling you is that it needs to stay within these bounds all the time. And that set point, uh, what we call the optimal set point, that is the actual uh, data point that the algorithm is telling the system, use a, use a set point within these bounds, your optimal and upper limit bounds, in order to control your system and reduce oscillation. So reduce error as much as possible. And what that looks like based on the data is what you see here, these red bounds, are as those optimal parameters uh, for the process. So what you see here over the course of time is that this system was actually behaving way outside the bounds of optimized those optimized machine learning limits. And any time, if I were, I don't have the ability to pan, uh, zoom in and out, but if I were to zoom in, you would see that all the white that's not within these red bounds is where you're seeing your instability is really where your where your savings or your inefficiencies are occurring. So the whole objective here with machine learning is to, to control that and to make sure that what's ever happening in the physical world is staying within those bounds. So in this in the data world, in the data science world, you know you're you know you're really, really controlling your system really good. And it's not a perfect science. I mean, you can see uh, see some data points here that are actually pretty dang good within those bounds. But to be able to identify this early and then have the mechanism to make the adjustment in real time is the key with some of these applications being successful. So we talk a lot about offline and online and how do you close the loop with your, some of your machine learning initiatives? And that's super important. Um, I'm sure a lot, of, a lot of folks on the call can really attest to you know, how difficult it is even on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the change management side. You know, everyone is, has their own bias as to what this means, what that means, but the theme here, guys, that I want to communicate with you is the faster you can build models, the more you can get more of your models, you know, on online and you can make sense of them. It's a very iterative process. I would rather, I would rather be comfortable with deploying a model that maybe only percent accurate 
instead of maybe spinning my wheels for the next couple of weeks on waiting for like that 99% accuracy. So my encouragement is, you know, don't, uh, don't get so caught up on the scoring. Uh, really just be, you know, really try to see how you can show value quickly based on the model that you've developed. And the key to, to uh, being, like I said, closing the loop is dealing with the human. So how you close your, how you close your applications, you have to define, you know, how much human inter, inter, uh, interoperability do I want in this application? How much do we really, how much information do we need to keep abstracting from their brain? Uh, you know, what, what do they feel would make sense per this application? So what you see here is kind of an example of how you wanna, in our world, structure some of these applications where everything starts with the location, geographical location, uh, the site, um, what defines that site are you know areas of 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 that particular facility within those areas you know you've got certain uh, assets you know subsystems components subcomponents you know tags models so this whole tree structure this hierarchy of how you what I was mentioning earlier you propagate your template is really key so you want to do that in a logical uh, nice organized fashion kind of how you guys are running uh, your file file folder structure on your laptop today. And then, you know, you mapping that model to any runtime should give you, you know, a lot of these features and, and, and give you the overall health of your model. And uh, always, you know, my, my encouragement, whether you're scripting models from, from scratch or you're using some sort of auto mechanism to generate your models, uh, this kind of gives you a, a glimpse, kind of gives you a glimpse as to, you know, there's a lot of code. Uh, it's definitely, definitely a lot of math, a lot of compute. But no matter what, please always back up your models. Um, try to. You know, always, um, always, you know, you know, expose what you can um, in your own, you know, your uh, Git, GitHub, GitLab, uh, whatever. You know, you want really people to see your work. So I think the more transparent you can be, the more consistent uh, you can be with, with sharing work. I think we're going to have a lot of, a lot of success in the industry. So that's that's a couple. Uh, that was a pointer uh, that I always like to say, just as, as a jokingly with our guys, make sure you back up your code and make sure it's living somewhere. Or at least share it with someone. Um, so that's. That's all I had. I was uh, two minutes, two minute or two, uh, one hour on the dot, right, right at two o'clock. Um, um, thank you for for this presentation. We have this is the time for everybody to to write uh, your questions or comments, uh, post them as a comment. There is a comment that uh, showed up quite in the beginning that I didn't want to interrupt you. And uh, Andreas wrote, almost surprised to see Industry 4 in a US-based presentation. Back in Germany, that term was more prevalent for a lot of years. So is this becoming now prevalent in the United States? Or is this has been all around? Yeah, it's, that's a great question. You know, honestly, guys, what's caused um, Industry 4.0 actually come alive more than ever has really been due to COVID. So when COVID hit here in North America, EL, uh, you saw a lot of pressure from a lot of these manufacturers, a lot of US-based companies saying, you know, we, 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 we can't survive. We can't keep doing the same thing that we were doing to ex and expect it for results. So based on a bad, really horrible situation, you know, obviously we're currently dealing with has actually forced companies to innovate and adopt like some of these European best practices. Why? Because there is a need to, uh, to do more with less and understanding. And then now, now that you know what kind of ebbs and flows with COVID, um, you know there is there is just a lot of pressure even right now on on how the global market and the economy is going. So things are definitely going in the right direction, um, and it's just a matter of time on you know being able to replicate what uh, you know the Middle East is doing, you know what 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 uh, what Europe's doing. There's just there's a lot of advancements occurring that where you know how do you incentivize um, and how can some of these companies not just think about the bottom line, but there's a lot of people that benefit from when companies go digital. When you go digital, you know, uh, there's a sustainability aspect, you know, you're, you're, there's an employee workforce engagement. Everyone benefits from your ability to go digital and adopt some of these industry 4.0 practices that Andreas had mentioned. I think you're on mute, EL. No worries. You're correct, I was on mute. Uh, you mentioned the decentralization and pushing more uh, intelligence to the to the edge. 
we had a presentation, I think more than a year ago um, here, that um, dealt with a federated machine learning. Meaning some of the machine learning actually takes place uh, at, at devices. Actually, some of it was driven by European uh, privacy standards that uh, this allow you sending pictures of people, for example, back to to some uh, storage or processing not at the edge. Is there, is it relevant to what what you were uh, covering? Yep. Yeah, abs absolutely. So based on that comment, yeah. I'll, so there was actually some legislation passed where our what we call uh, ICS, so our industrial control system. So what powers every industry, you know, there are the, actually some of the most exposed systems, you know, compared to the banking industry, you know, compared to, you know, uh, you know uh, online e-market, e-commerce, they're just exposed. So meaning that if you don't have a, if, if everything is centralized and everything is dealing with legacy based systems, they're vulnerable for attack. So with this legislation, it was basically a mandate to saying that these companies have to adopt these principles and have to decouple and have decentralized collection, processing, security standards to avoid those vulnerabilities. So um, I would say definitely in manufacturing or the industry in general, it's they're very exposed. It's, no one really talks about security. But if you do adhere to some of those protocols and you do start to develop like a, what we call that MQTT broker, you would, there's just there's a lot of a uh, lot of benefits from a security aspect from having a decentralized architecture. OK, and uh, one more thing, I think I, I maybe I missed a, a piece of what you said, or I did not completely understand what a digital twin means. Can you explain more about that? So a digital twin is um, essentially a, a, a replica, a digital replica of a process. So we talked about how we, what we mean is, you know, how do you define a digital twin is, you know, a series of different regression algorithms where you're doing, you're trying to predict things on a linear basis, but these systems are, uh, these systems are not linear. They're nonlinear, they are multivariate. So it's actually using a combination combination of those available regressions that I showed you to essentially predict where where uh, where that particular process should be. So if we use a motor, this algorithm learns how this motor is performing on a on a certain amount of time, and based on like we talk about other production events, it knows what kind of load it should handle. So this digital twin model should also should show you what its value is at in real time and should be able to show you in the next 10 or 15 minutes, mm -hmm. this motor needs to be at this particular value. So within those two values, y'all, you're basically calculating the error, and that error is your opportunity to close that window as fast as possible to basically keep up with that predicted value. So it's just replicating or simulating your process in real time with real data, a digital twin. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, anyone else? I don't see any more uh, comments. Um, let's see, is this a comment? Okay, so uh, I think uh, this uh, this uh, will will be it for today. Thank you very much. That was very uh, comprehensive and very yep. uh, useful to to learn about. And uh, it uh, this presentation will uh, will stay here. Um, on the channel for uh, whoever could not make it at this time. And we have some uh, thank yous coming in the comments. Thank you, everybody, for uh, for showing up. Thank you very much, AJ. We'll see you guys next time. And uh, goodbye for now. Thank you for having me. Thank you, y'all. Thank you, Vivian. Take care, everyone. Our pleasure. Bye-bye.